Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so nice to see you. This is our October Necessary Conversations of the International Humanistic Management Association. Um, we're here today with Henry Mintzberg, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, Henry will be, hi Henry, uh, talking about humanizing society by humanizing management and organizations. Um, this and other necessary conversations are sponsored by uh, the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility at UMass Lowell in the Manning School of Business. And while people are still joining, and we should have a, a large number of people joining today, just a note that we have a variety of other necessary conversations coming up in November with Otto Scharmer from MIT on Leading Towards Wellbeing, in December with Gretchen Spreitzer from the University of Michigan on Thriving in the New World of Work, and we have Jeff Pfeffer planning to join us in January, um, and that's a to be determined date and topic, um, but just to keep you apprised of what's to come. Um, and that's not all. We have Sandra Waddock leading intellectual shaman conversations with people like Jerry Davis, Stuart Hart, and Tima Bansal, and that's all just coming up. Uh, there's a link in the chat where those events are available, at least the ones coming up. Um, Lots of other things going on. We welcome you to any or all of these. Um, again, these are all um, initiatives of the EMA. And I'm gonna turn it briefly over to Michael Pearson to give a short introduction and then we'll turn it over to Henry. Well, thank you, Erica, and thank you, everybody, for being on. Thank you, Henry, for doing this. This is wonderful. And these are sort of ongoing conversations in some way. We have dubbed them necessary because I think we have too few of them and we sort of act poorly on, on some of the content. <laughs> Uh, given the various crises that we're facing as a species. But I think exactly this topic that Henry is touching on and many others are sort of in some way struggling with is, is critical for us to deal with. We call it humanistic management. Many people could call it other kinds of things, but we just use this as a frame. And the two things are the protection of dignity and then the promotion of well-being. And that's what we distinguish typical management practices uh, from. And so we're trying to provide a platform here with the International Humanistic Management Association for professionals in all kinds of ways that want to be connected. So please check us out. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Erica and, and Henry. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, so just again, a reminder for those just joining us, we are recording this necessary conversation. It will be available to everyone who registered via YouTube. To facilitate that and the quality of the recording, we would ask that everyone please mute. On the bottom left, there's a mute option. And if you select that, that makes the recording um, typically a lot better. Um, we will also moderate Q&A with Henry. And that happens in the chat box. So if you have questions along the way, please input your question. And we won't get to all the questions, but we will preserve the chat. So the chat itself will also be available to all participants. Um, although absolutely no introduction is necessary, <laughs> we turn now to our conversation with Henry Mintzberg from McGill University's De Sutel's Faculty of Management. And if um, registration is any indication of interest for this topic that we're discussing today with Henry, uh, this really is a, 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 a high in terms of number of people who've registered for this conversation. So thank you all for joining us. Um, Henry, really, uh, I couldn't possibly talk about all of what makes Henry extraordinary in our field. So I'll just say briefly, um, he's authored over 20 books, one of which we'll talk a little bit about today and a forthcoming book as well. Um, countless articles, in fact, I hope I'm not dating you, too much, Henry, but I think over 50 years of articles um, in our field. More recently, a tweet to blog or twog, and that was sent out in the registration email. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to look at that one particular article going public with my puzzle, but there are many other well worth your time in reading these. Um, Henry's concerned most and most recently with how organizations and managers can facilitate transformative problem solving in the face of multiple crises facing humanity. And Henry's thought leadership challenges us collectively in this field to do and be more in light of global challenges. So we're so delighted to have you with us, Henry. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm going to start with one somewhat broad question for you and we'll narrow in. So can you tell us a little bit about the scope of your career? And in particular, what led you to explore the nature of structuring and managing organizations, 
and the urgency of rebalancing society. Okay. Um, I, I hate to be contrarian, but I will, I will not mute. Um, but um, you're going in and out a bit, and it says the internet connection, my internet connection, or ours, or whatever, is unstable. Well, that's okay, because the whole world um, is unstable right now, so why could my internet connection uh, be any different? So, um, I was chatting with my spouse about um, this uh, uh, idea of uh, humanistic, and I said, I don't really use the word, and she said, come on, that's what you've always been doing, that's what you are. Um, and as I started to think about it, I, I guess she's right. Um, right from the very beginning, I guess, um, the first thing I ever did, I suppose, was try and humanize management. Um, trying to get it away from planning, organizing, coordinating, and controlling, which don't sound very human, to getting interrupted and talking a lot and listening a lot and uh, and being interrupted. I said that I'm being interrupted all the time, but also action oriented and 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 so on and so forth. So I guess my first book set the tone, and everything else kind of followed. And and in a sense, if I apply the word humanistic to what I've been doing. Um, it, it works kind of well. Um, so the book that's coming out now in February is called um, um, Bedtime Stories for Managers. Um, and it's a collection of those twogs that Erica mentioned. And uh, let me just mention, what I'm going to do is mention some of the stories and, um, and, and we'll give you an idea. The first story is called Managing Scrambled Eggs. Um, and it's about the chief executive of an airline that sure very big airline uh, that was soon to go bankrupt um, and they served these scrambled eggs and I said to the flight attendant I've never had anything this bad and she said I know we keep telling them they won't listen now if you're running a cemetery and you don't listen to your clients I can understand but running an airline um, anyway the the other stories some of the other stories are about uh, um, uh, selecting flawed managers I guess that's humanistic the fact that we're all flawed how often do we select managers for their flaws? Because after all, it's their flaws that do them in. And so you want to make sure that uh, the flaws are not going to be, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, inescapable under the circumstances. And anyway, there's all kinds of others. There's one about uh, um, analyzing, uh, uh, getting an analyst to analyze their own behaviors. Um, because they want to change everybody else except themselves. Uh, and, uh, and one about, um, um, in my book on healthcare, um, comes out of my book on healthcare, um, some ideas like treating uh, patients like people instead of like patients. So it's all humanizing uh, one way or another. Same thing with what I've done on organizations. I've set out to make organizations more human and less bureaucratic and I won't go into the details but um, one of these stories is about organizing like a cow um, because an ad once said you know um, do we want to organize our companies uh, like a chart or like a cow uh, because in cows all the parts interact and work together naturally in a human kind of way so anyway that um, now and maybe we'll get into it with the subsequent question. Uh, my real effort is on humanizing society and and um, and through my book, uh, Rebalancing Society, uh, the notion of the plural sector, which is another term for, for civil society, uh, the fact that we're completely out of balance in, West, in the Western world and much of the world on the side of private sector forces. We've weakened government, we've weakened the plural sector, um, and societies are dangerously out of balance. The plural sector is the human sector in a way, not that companies or governments aren't human, um, but the plural sector is where we spend most of our lives. Uh, I don't think there's anybody listening who hasn't interacted with a plural sector with five or 10 plural sector organizations in the last week, whether you've gone to the Y to work out or gone to some club or donated to Greenpeace or whatever it is, we're constantly in touch with plural sector organizations, and yet community, essentially, many of them, organizations or associations, and yet we don't um, recognize that. Um, 
just one last um, point that the uh, the closing line in my book, um, because there's a story on gross national happiness uh, in Bhutan and how the economists came in and absolutely destroyed it in a way or damaged it by their ridiculous measures up to 70 and 80 measurements. I can't think of any worse way to kill something or better way to kill something. So I end the book talking about great natural happiness, which is, I guess, humanistic. Great. And you mentioned this idea of measurement. So how do we do that better? That's what we seem to be so obsessed with. Well, we do it better by doing less of it. Um, uh, it's not the measurement's bad. Obviously, we have to measure what we can. We just can't let measurement dominate us, and it does. The most ridiculous statement going around, or one of them, there are so many in management, one of the most ridiculous statements is, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Well, we would stop living if that was true, and we'd close down organizations if that was true. I mean, Porter and Kaplan started an article with that sentence. I, I can't believe it. That's got to be the dumbest thing on earth. We can't measure culture very well. We can't measure leadership. We can't measure management. Who measures measurement? Um, you know, so... So sure, measure what you can, but don't get dominated by measurement. And we are, we're constantly dominated by measurement. I, it's destroyed education because after all, we can't imagine educating kids unless we measure everything they learn. Well, I defy anybody to measure what a child really learns in the classroom. And don't tell me it's IQ tests. Mm -hmm. So I defy anybody to measure what kids learn in the classroom. So, yes, measurement in its place is fine. It's like capitalism in its place, which is the marketplace. Uh, measurement in its place, which is as one factor in helping us make decisions. So just building on that, I'm curious if you have some insight into other blind spots that we have. What else should we be seeing that we're not? What else should we be recognizing that we're not? How do we get to be better? At this? How do we do it better as managers? How do we do it better as scholars? Um, unfortunately, we only have an hour. <laughs> uh, how about top, top management? If you see yourself on top, then, then you're disconnected from what's on the ground. Uh, managers have to connect, they have to be on the ground, they have to be involved. Um, so top management, uh, um, I don't know, I've got so much in the book, um, you know, the whole notion of control and structured organizations and uh, I don't know, it's not hitting me right now, but so much of our vocabulary is so utterly dysfunctional. Um, patience, you know, um, uh, it, it, you know, physicians are very happy to call people patients, but when they start treating them as people and not just patients, uh, the changes. So there's this wonderful article called The Bell Curve uh, by Gowande in New York, uh, New Yorker um, about this uh, physician who was sort of renowned for doing better than anybody else at the very treatments, with the very treatments that everybody else was using. So Gowande observed them and he discovered that this guy took the time to find out what, his, what this particular patient was worried about. You know, he'd said, are you doing her tests? And she said, yeah, and then discovered, he discovered she wasn't. And then he said, all right, how do we uh, take the time to uh, take some time to figure out how you can do these tests? Let me help you. That's why he had such a good performance. And, um, and yet, uh, the accountants to that hospital would have said, uh, yeah, but she's going to live longer. And they would have said, yeah, but how do we measure that? We got a budget to meet. So what if she's going to live longer? Another example of, of measurement. So, Great. No shortage of, of that. And I'm just curious, can you just take us back to this moment in time in your training or your research, your writing, your thinking? No, I'm not hearing you. Sorry. Wait, wait, I didn't hear you. You got cut off. Yeah. Start again. So can you take us back in time to your training, your research, your work, your thinking, where you realized that there was a fundamental problem 
that management knowledge, what we were teaching, what we're researching was going in a direction that actually wasn't fundamentally helpful, at least in terms of the global challenges we face today. You know, my first, yeah, I, I missed part of it, but I guess I got enough of the gist. Um, my first article was called The Science of Strategy Making, and um, so kind of that's where I was. And the chapter in my first book, which was probably the only thing I ever regret, um, was about programming managerial work. You know, like, I didn't call it artificial intelligence because nobody ever heard of that term in those days, but but it, it wrote about programming managerial work, and uh, boy, I dropped that quick enough. What I found in that very same is that managing is, um, is a different kind of thing. There, there was a in, in my career, or, or maybe it wasn't, maybe it's better to say I was on the edge and this pushed me completely over. And that was some correspondence I had with Herbert Simon, um, which is actually recorded with his permission before, long before he passed away in my book called Mintzberg on Management. And, and, and it was when I published the article called Planning on the Left Side, Managing on the Right, about connecting the two hemispheres with management and planning. And, and I ran it past Simon because he was a cognitive psychologist by then and uh, he knew better. So, so I sent it to him and, um, uh, and said, you know, should I go ahead with this? And he said, oh no, this is all bunk. Um, and, and I had to decide, it was going in the Harvard Business Review, and just when I got his email, I was in, it wasn't an email, it was probably a letter, but I was in France, and Harvard called, and the Harvard Business Review called and said, we need it right away, and I had to decide whether Simon was right and I should pull it, or was he being blocked? And, 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 and I decided he was being blocked, and what caused me to decide he was being blocked was a line in his his um, letter about extrasensory perception and how we all know that that's not true um, because I had a line like that in the original article that both I and Harvard both took out. And so, and so I, I wrote him back and I quoted Turing, who he admired, obviously, um, who said, who referred to extrasensory perception as the evidence is overwhelming. So I quoted that to Simon, that that's sort of sent me over the edge. You know, we just lost Jim March. And I once said to Jim, you know, you and Simon published this great book together. Simon went one way to be more, more sort of narrow in a sense, or more classic. And you went more playful with, you know, garbage can models and all that stuff. And he would not say a word uh, against Simon at all, but I was curious about this idea that they went in different directions. And I, like March, I kind of threw off the shackles and said the hell with it. And ever since, I haven't looked back. Great, so I can already see that we have some really insightful questions coming through, but I have one more, and it's on the topic of throwing off the shackles. Um, so what suggestions do you have? For this audience in particular, and we all are all, I think, primarily researchers in the field of management and scholars, um, but in terms of what we're puzzling over in the fields of business management and organizing, how do we throw off the shackles? Are we asking the right questions? Can you suggest more effective inroads or bridges to catalyze this necessary radical renewal and transformational change? Uh, you know what? We're, we're, too often we're not asking the right questions, we're generating the wrong hypotheses. Um, I, I, I once claimed that I never met a hypothesis that was worth testing. Um, that's not quite true, but, but um, I prefer and I tell my doctoral students that what you have to do is ask an interesting question. Um, so much research doesn't ask interesting questions, it just fits into some conventional hypothesis that nobody really cares that much about. I remember going way back all the all the studies of does planning pay, you know, and all these empirical studies. It was so bad. It was so bad. And then I once went to a leadership conference and the, I couldn't believe the paper. I was supposed to be the commentary, commentator on these papers. And I showed all the papers to a couple of practitioner friends of mine who were very smart. And they just tore these papers apart. 
they actually tore these, like, is this what you're doing in leadership? I can't believe it. Um, I, I published their comments in, uh, in a paper called, if you're not serving Bill and Barbara, then you're not serving leadership. All, all the papers I've done, people can find on minsberg.org slash articles or, um, or the blog on, uh, on the same site, you'll find the blog slash blog. Um, so, so uh, are we asking the right questions? I guess what I'm saying is, are we asking questions? And, and you know, instead of generating hypotheses, and, and um, you know, the physicians are all hot on evidence-based medicine. Um, yet when we, we have a, a wonderful healthcare program for mid-career people in healthcare, imhl.org and um and we ask them uh, you know we ask them are you evidence-based or experience-based plot this on a scale you know one side or the other they're all over the place and they don't lean towards evidence-based more than experience-based in fact some of the some of the sharpest uh, surgeons put themselves more to experience-based than evidence-based. So now we're trying to pick that up in management. We've got evidence-based management. Well, evidence-based management is non-management. Just look at a manager and tell me how much the managers do in their practice is evidence-based. You know, how much of this leadership, like I said before, measurement, you know? Uh, you're supposed to measure everything. Uh, measure is better which which measurement fan has ever measured the impact of measurement you know which analyst has ever Im measured the impact of analysis uh, i measured i mentioned before this uh, this porter and um, and uh, kaplan article that started up with with measurement and 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 they give the incredible number of steps for going through an operation and, 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 you know, step one to seven, and I said, where's step eight? What's the cost of doing all this? Have they measured the cost of doing their own analysis? Has anybody ever measured the cost of doing their own analysis? Great. Um, so I, I think we're, we're about 20 minutes in, and we have another at least 40-ish minutes to go. I know there are lots of people with questions, and I'm actually going to ask, because we've been in conversation, Michael Pearson and David Wasilewski, if you can um, help me moderate the chat a bit until I can catch up. Um, so David or Michael, can you suggest a question to start off with for Henry? So I'm just reading through the chat and trying to synthesize an, a number of the early questions and they're sort of going in the direction. If you see that the trend over the past 50 years, how has management changed? And then with the view towards the 2030 agenda, uh, do you think it's changing enough? Is, is an organization at this point able to help and facilitate uh, a 2030 sustainable development agenda? And what if it isn't? Well, how has management changed? For one thing, it's been transformed into leadership. Um, and, and we got, you know, all these articles or a few of them from uh, starting with Dennis and, and others and Carter following suit as always um, 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 uh, that leadership is somehow better and superior and more important than management um, so what we get now is what I call lofty leadership um, and not enough engaging management um, you first of all you can't separate leadership from management it's leaders who don't manage don't know what's going on um, and that's not the kind of management anybody wants uh, and so we need we need leadership and management coupled together, and um, and there's still plenty of wonderful uh, grounded management around. You know, just read about the entrepreneurs. Read about Steve Jobs, who spent his mornings in the labs developing products. I mean, what was this guy doing developing products? What book in management ever said that the chief executive of a big corporation should spend every single morning developing products? I mean, that's terrible. He had some, pat you know, he got his own patents sometimes from what he was doing in the morning. Well, what was he doing? Doing that, that's all wrong. More, not he, but his company cr together created more shareholder value than anybody in the history of business. Doesn't matter. The fact is he was doing it wrong. Um, so, so we've got all these distorted uh, views. So how has management changed? It ceased to be 
it's it's gotten away from its roots in both senses the roots in the other sense with roots in the sense of being grounded it's gotten away from that and that is um uh, has been very very destructive I, and just to close what i'm saying about that question management fundamentally doesn't change it's not it's not like engineering where you have to be you know, sort of the latest. You have to, the, the, the context of management changes, the, the, the environment changes, markets change, all kinds of things change. The practice of management is fundamental. It doesn't change. Um, and, um, and, and the fact that it's become so detached has, has damaged it very seriously. And, and as I said in one of my twogs, the number of times people come up to me and complain bitterly about their bosses. They don't know what's going on. They're issuing all these orders. Uh, they don't know what's happening on the ground. They're not meeting customers. The number of times this happens to me is, uh, one time was four people in one week came up and sort of raised this issue with me. Great, thank you. I think David um, is, yeah, I, I, I'm seeing some very good questions on the chat. Um, Henry, um, Peter Stark is asking your thoughts on businesses as vital social institutions and asking for your thoughts on what role businesses should play in society. Yeah, I'm getting broken a bit, but uh, but I got businesses as responsible social institutions. Uh, business is so influential today, um, far more influential outside its own sphere. One of the things I claim is that business be put in its place, which is the social space. The, the power of corporations to influence public policy is way, way, way beyond what's necessary. I, I, I'm a huge fan of business. I get, I have, I love my iPhone. I love my car. I eat in great restaurants. I love businesses that function really, really well. I say to any corporate, corporate mm -hmm. chief executive who's more responsible, I say, get out of our government. Get your company out of our government. You as a citizen and I as a citizen have every right to lobby our government as long as we don't disproportionately use money to do that. Um, but get out of our government. Well, that's a bit laughable today to say that to any corporation um, because the intertwining, you know, the, when the American Supreme Court passed the uh, citizens, you know, uh, ruled on the Citizens United case, what they did was they legalized bribery in the United States. They essentially legalized bribery. And now we're seeing the results of it. And it's destroying, and I use that word carefully, it is destroying American democracy and it's spreading around the world. And that's the main reason why we're getting all these thugs, um, not least in the United States, elected to high office. It's gonna happen now in Brazil probably, in Turkey it happened, in Egypt it happened, and uh, Hungary and Poland and Brexit in the UK and, we're in dire straits. So, so the, 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 the main responsibility of business, business as a social institution is to stop distorting power in society, contribute to balance uh, across the sectors, public, private, and what I call plural, um, or, or civil society, contribute to balance instead of continuing to I'm blaming every single company. Uh, there's just too many with too much power. So Henry, just to follow up on that, are there any companies in particular or any models that you would highlight as, as going beyond the norm, as actually you know, working toward the betterment of society, of rebalancing society in the way that I think seems pretty important to you? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm reluctant to comment on companies I read about, like Unilever. Maybe it's true. It probably is true or was true, whatever. Um, so, you know, it's probably an example, but I can't vouch for that. Um, what I can vouch for are people I know, usually entrepreneurs, sometimes having built up fairly sizable companies, but still in control, 
so that the wolves of Wall Street are not uh, baying for the bones of their workers at the door because they haven't produced more, more, more. You know, Apple reaches a trillion and the market needs more, more, more. And so what's Apple to do? Well, maybe they can take down our batteries and get more, more, more. So, so we need to, um, uh, 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 I think we need to get companies, more and more of them out of the stock market. But what I find, I met a, a wonderful entrepreneur a few days ago in Montreal. The guy's doing really interesting stuff uh, on, uh, on artificial intelligence. And he, like many others I met, are deeply and seriously concerned with what they can do to enhance the, um, if you like the balance, not their word, but the balance or the, the progress in society. A guy came to see me from Quebec City. He was an engineer who started a company that does the tagging of products, you know, like pharmaceutical products that check where the products are going by, by some radioactive or whatever it is tagging. This guy's got 900 employees. He came to see, one of the biggest in the world doing this from Quebec City. He came to see me um, because he was thoroughly interested in the social agenda. I mean, these people are not just, this is not an add-on. These are people who see um, these uh, issues as as important as their business issues, um, and that's these people are quite amazing. But boy, as soon as you hit the stock market, wow, that's it. Yeah. Why are you giving away our money? You know, even though patient capital can lead to much better long-term success very often than this hot sort of instant need for capital, capital acquisition, capital uh, increase. Great. Thank Michael or David, I think you've compiled again or synthesized a question. Yeah, I think one of the questions here, here popping up is in, in what way um, humanistic management or the, the notion of protecting dignity and promoting well-being is a fad or is potentially a, a categorization or maybe provide some vocabulary that could be helpful to get institutions or managers uh, to rebalance. Um. Wow. Um, God, I don't, I hope being human isn't a fad. Um, I hope that being inhuman is a fad. <laughs> I hope that that monster in Saudi Arabia is dealt with, um, you know. Uh, being inhuman is a fad, um, and, uh, and it's a fad that will destroy us. Um, or I hope it's a fad. Um, but being decent, it's all about decency. It's all, you know, you, if you, you, do you go to bed at night feeling kind of good about what you've been doing and not just good about increasing shareholder value? You know, I use a slide, a PowerPoint from a guy running a British television network who said, my job is to wake up every morning uh, and think about shareholder value. And and he's a, not a good person. I say, well, which women in the audience would like to wake up next to this guy? You know? Yeah, Henry, sir, if you follow up on this. Um, more and more. Uh, by the way, I was just going to say, shareholder value is another of these terms. That, it's got nothing to do with humanistic or human values. It has to do with greed, pure, unadulterated, or pure, adulterated greed. So Tatiana asked a question that I think builds on what you've been saying here. What are your insights on educating great managers slash leaders? I mean, what, uh, what kinds of approaches do you recommend and use? Uh -huh. What a question. I, I, that kind of, that you're sure that the question didn't come from me? <laughs> <laughs> I love the question. It, I mean, you, sounds like you it. know, I was, I was going around doing my flagellation lectures years ago. I call them my flagellation lectures. At one point I was invited to a lot of different business schools to talk about things. And I would, I would tell them that they should close down their MBA programs, that, that MBA programs in the wrong ways with, the wrong consequences otherwise they're fine um, and people started to say what are you doing about this you know you're not supposed to say that to an academic we're only supposed to complain so 
so we developed the IMHL, IMPM, the International Master's uh, Program for Managers. Um, and essentially what we're doing, it's so simple and so obvious and so hard to get some people to do it until they see it and experience it. And that is, you can't create a manager in a classroom. So you take people who are managers. And then, you, and then what you do is give them an opportunity to learn from each other and reflect on their own experience. Cases, are, cases aren't secondhand, the way Livingston wrote an article years ago. Cases are fifth hand, you know. Somebody did it, the chief executive reported it, because cases are usually focused around the chief executive, 62% of them. Uh, um, and then they're written up by somebody else and they're taught by somebody else and they're executed by some student who's pronouncing on a company that he or she never heard about. So, 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 so first-hand experience, we, if we have a class of 35 people, we have a half a millennium or a millennium, uh, probably half a millennium of managerial experience in that class since they average about 40 40, 45 years old. We get them, sit them at round tables and they spend half their time learning from each other. It's so simple and that has opened up an enormous, enormous opportunity for innovation. I and mean, we do all kinds of fantastic things. We, we do friendly consulting where they work with each other to help on each other's problems. We do managerial exchanges where they spend the better part of a week observing each other at their workplace. Um, we have seating arrangements that will blow everybody away, you know, where, where we have keynote listeners instead of keynote speakers. At each table, somebody listens and reports out. Instead of somebody at the table reporting on their own brilliant idea, you have a listener reporting on what he heard or she heard from the other people. It, people can see that in uh, IMPM.org, uh, or IMHL for healthcare.org, but, but it's not hard to do. A MBA programs are fine at developing specialized functions like marketing or finance or accounting. They're a nevma to the practice of management. Just imagine 800 Harvard kids, and I really, kids, they're in their 20s, 800 Harvard kids with probably very little uh, real managerial experience pronouncing on hundreds and hundreds of cases. What does that produce? It produces George W. Bush. That's what it produces. So, Henry, I'm... Yeah, let, me, let me just add something. Uh, one of my blogs is, uh, is about um, evidence uh, on MBA uh, program. And now there's more and more evidence that MBAs uh, do worse as chief executive officers than non-MBAs uh, and, by the way, get paid more. So I'm, I'm paraphrasing now from Misha Nair um, as a follow-up to this question. Um, so which direction do you see management education going in? Um, it sounds like we should be doing less casework, but what other pedagogical changes should we be enacting? Well, we need to differentiate. I mean, it's not going in that direction because, you know, there are not that many. The, the people who see what we do go home and try and copy it or copy it but the but the people don't can't imagine it so so um but but i think there needs to be a differentiation in the business schools between mba programs which are not for managers and they're not training managers and as i said in my book managers not mbas they should all have a skull and crossbones on their forehead that says warning not prepared to manage okay or worse you know may have picked up a distorted view of management because it's all it's so much analysis and so little art and so little craft and so much analysis um, and differentiate programs for managers from programs for specialists um, and do the kind of things we do. They, they work, they work. People, uh, we got a, 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 an email a day or two ago from a uh, who's subordinate in a senior position in healthcare in Ethiopia, came to our healthcare program, and he wrote to us and he said, this person is so changed that I want to go on the program too. Um, and that's not the first time that's happened. Um, we asked in the very first class, in the third module, they're, they're sort of 10-day modules spread over four months. In the third module, 
somebody in the class asked her colleagues if if the program ha had had uh, had led to life life change you know change their lives everybody but one said yes the one said they weren't sure yet great David or Michael, did you have some follow up as well? Yes, sure. Um, the, the, everyone, please uh, understand we have so many people on this call, which is fantastic. Everyone wants to see Henry. So we're not going to be able to get to all of your questions, but um, we'll see what we can do about following up afterwards. So uh, just trying to stay in line with the thinking and, and discussion that's going on now. Um, there's a question from Sabrina Is the passion for agility? that she sees in the moment in all companies going to help support a change in mm -hmm. more humanistic management. I'm wondering if you, uh, David, David, if you took off, David, if you took off your video, maybe I, maybe I'll hear you better. I don't know. I, I don't know if that's possible, but uh, everything was distorted. Yeah. It, Sabrina asks if the passion for agility, um, seen in a lot of companies is going to help support a change to a more humanistic management. She's referring to sort of decentralized decision making and uh, experimentation in organizations. Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, uh, the agile groups, um, I've spoken to them in Montreal, I spoke to a couple of them in, uh, in uh, Australia, seems to be developing everywhere. I, I think, I, I'm not one for buzzwords, but, but I do think uh, they're on a logical track, um, uh, which is to flatten out the organizations. Let, let me tell you my favorite story about strategy, okay? It's such a good, st I mean, we all know that strategies are formulated in order to be implemented. They come from the top, all that kind of stuff. So w one of the most successful strategies in business today is Ikea's strategy of selling its furniture unassembled. Brilliant, amazing strategy. Well, go on their website and read how it came to be. Uh, a worker uh, tried to put a table in his car and didn't fit, so he took the legs off. And then came the key strategic moment, which is somebody said, the website doesn't say whether it's that worker or somebody else nearby, uh, but not, I doubt if the chief executive was standing there. Somebody said, hey, wait a minute, if we have to take the legs off, so do our customers, okay? That was the key moment. And then the, the key process for agility, if you want to talk about agility, the key process was that that idea made its way to the people who could do something with it. So they didn't formulate the strategy, they picked up an, a strategic idea from the ground and ran with it, okay? And that's, that's how learning planning goes from the top. It's a learning process from the ground up. It comes from dealing with customers and products and, and, and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, another story about Ikea. How come you go into the warehouse in Ikea? What a good idea. How come other stores don't let you in the warehouse, only Ikea? Let's you in the warehouse. Well, somebody told me this story personally that the, um, from Ikea that the, um, they opened a great big store in Stockholm um, and they were so inundated <clears throat> on the first day <clears throat> that the person behind the counter who was supposed to take the, the requests <clears throat> and go fetch the furniture, <clears throat> they were so inundated, they just shuffled the desk away and said, here, go find it yourself. Uh, and you can imagine the chaos on the first day because they weren't geared for it, um, but eventually they worked that out. That's what strategy is about. That's what learning is about. And it's agile. It's agile and it's flat and it's horizontal. And let's get rid of the term top management. Just throw it in the garbage. If we don't say bottom management, we shouldn't say top management. Okay. So here, uh, Erica, you No, go ahead. Yeah, so a couple of other questions sort of refer to a number of other concepts and they may be buzzwords or they may be representative of something larger, but I just throw some of them out. Humanocracy, B Corps, um, and uh, we'll, yeah, we'll start with those. In what way, what do you think is, is there uh, in, in terms of to stay and, and how does it uh, potentially help with balancing society? I, I, missed, I missed the whole first part. Do you want to, maybe if you try and take off your video, let's see if that works. I heard the last part, but I didn't know the context. 
So there are a number of buzzwords that are mentioned and I'm just throwing out humanocracy and uh, B Corps. In what way do you think they help these concepts, these ideas that are coming up uh, in terms of rebalancing society? Well, I'm not sure about the first one. I never heard it before, but B Corps I know well about. And, and, and actually when you're, or, or Erica, whoever was asking me the question about, um, uh, about um, when I was talking about entrepreneurial companies and, and managers who are in touch, um, my own publisher, Barrett Kohler, is a benefit corp, um, which I guess goes a little bit beyond the B Corp, or maybe I'm mixing them up with one way or the other. Uh, and, and I was there committed to, um, to uh, that. Uh, that certainly helps to rebound society because it makes corporations, or at least it, it um, institutionalizes the idea of social and environmental goals or, or, or you know, uh, targets alongside economic ones. Um, so that obviously helps to rebound society. Uh, but let me give a qualification. The popular view in the United States is that this problem will be fixed by fixing capitalism. Um, I have a collection of about eight or 10 forms of, of adjectival, what I call adjectival capitalism, caring capitalism and, and you know, uh, uh, I, don't know, humanistic, I don't know if there's a humanistic capitalism, but this capitalism and that capitalism, my favorite is democratic capitalism because democracy is the adjective and capitalism is the noun. Look at, they got their priorities straight. Um, and, um, and, and, and we're not going to fix society by fixing capitalism, although we do need to fix capitalism. We're going to fix society by, by achieving a balance across the three sectors so that the, the public sector has much more respect um, and deserves it. Um, for, for what it does. Now, how is anybody supposed to respect Congress in the United States today when they're all essentially paid off by this legal corruption, this legal bribing? Um, but, um, but there are many countries that have very strong, respected governments, not least of all my own in Canada. And it works very well. You get the government you deserve. We believe government can do good things, so government does good things. They don't always get it right but they don't get it wrong any more often than business gets it wrong. Um, and, and the plural sector, which has to be much more active, much more energetic. And, and you know, marches are fine and, and people march and they express themselves. You know, I think, I think Trump just laughs at these things um, because marches with clout matter. So if the kids in Florida are concerned about guns and assault rifles, then put a million kids around Congress and don't go away until you get the, the legislation you want. Um, you know, that's action, not just marching. It's got to be coupled with action. So all these things together and cooperatively, cooperatively, so that, uh, so that responsible, decent corporations work together with active uh, you know, social groups and with a government that is concerned and not bribed by its population. So conceivably responsible, decent organizations are comprised of responsible, decent human beings. And the right. theme that's come up in the chat has been um, this idea of how would you suggest or how should we be thinking about the necessity of human consciousness to catch up with the necessity for better management. So, and in particular, yeah. some questions about personal practices such as mindfulness, meditation, or other considerations for how yeah. individuals can manage better. Maybe, maybe, maybe close the video just temporarily because I'm, I'm not hearing. Sure. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Great. Um, so one of the themes in the chat box has been how do, how do human individuals do management better in terms of practices, individual or personal practices, such as meditation or mindfulness? Is that part of the equation that you think about from a more holistic uh, renewal of society standpoint? Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody's, uh, uh, people need to reflect. Um, and I didn't use the word before, maybe I did, but in our programs that I described earlier, reflection is absolutely front and center. 
in what we do. And I don't, I don't mean necessarily that kind of reflection, but reflection, but any kind of reflection is important. You know, I often wondered, well, I don't, I, I, I've been to ashrams, but it doesn't kind of grab me that much. I don't meditate. I don't do any of that. And then it occurred to me, I canoe. <laughs> That's what I do. I canoe or I hike and, 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 or a bicycle. And, and particularly bicycling is a bit more dangerous. You've got to watch where you're going. But in a canoe or in a, I was on the canoe uh, yesterday and the wind was huge and I did not concentrate on anything but the wind. Actually, it was a kayak. I've never seen kayak out of control like that and the water was cold i should have been a but anyway i did make it to today and um so i canoe or i or i hike or i i just and my mind wanders and you know i i carry pads around because i'm scribbling ideas that are coming to me all the time because the world go um, but that's my kind of meditation. So yeah, whatever works for you is great. Great. I, I really appreciate that idea of personal retreats and being a conduit for ideas. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, David or Michael, do you see some other themes as we close in on our hour? I, I see a, a question a little unrelated that I think is a good one to ask regarding corporate governance. Clark asks if um, you think it would be of any use if we change the reporting mechanisms of public companies so that it's not exclusively on the financial aspects of the organization and then include yeah. details on how an organization fulfills its mission by providing goods and services and acting in dignity, I would add. Yeah, the last part cut off, but, but, but uh, you know, uh, the problem is that the economic, the, the, the problem with that and the problem with the balanced scorecard is it can never be balanced because the economic factors are so much easier to measure than the others. And that's why they drive out the others. So, so it's easy to measure profit or sales growth or whatever. Uh, at least we have ways of doing it, but it's much harder to, me to measure how you know how sensitive you've been to the environment or whether you know uh, we, we can get measures of whether workers are happy and all that um, but it's much harder to measure the social and the environmental than the economic especially a company's own contribution to it um, uh, but the but the other things that could be first of all quarterly quarterly reporting is is star graving nuts i mean you got a company that's making a trillion dollars uh, of sales a year and, and you're checking every four months how they're doing. I mean, it's kind of, kind of somebody who looks at the watch every five minutes because they're so anxious. I mean, quarterly reporting is just silly. But I think the companies that have it right, even on the stock market, are companies like Tata in India and most of the major companies like Carlsberg in Denmark um, that are publicly traded, but the voting control is held by trusts, often family trusts or some kind of foundation. Um, and so they can keep the stock market at bay, which is actually better for the serious investors. It's not better for the day traders. Uh, that should be stopped anyway. There should be tax on day trading, but, but the, the serious investors. Great. Erica, I have some couple of questions that are Please, go ahead. Henry, you can, uh, and you can hear me. So there are a couple of unrelated topics, but I'm just throwing that at, at them at you. Uh, undergrad education in business or management, what's your take on that? The other one is developing managers, uh, de uh, managers in the developing world. Uh, what, what potential danger do you see there? And then a whole other range of conversation in terms of well-being and GDP and, and uh, that uh, question. Um, typically at McGill and I think in many schools the undergraduates are a lot more interesting and creative than the MBAs uh, probably because they're not so uptight about you know racing out and getting a job and becoming chief executive of a company they don't understand um, and, and more entrepreneurs it seems to me or I don't know if there's figures on this but I would suspect more entrepreneurs are coming out of undergraduate programs in business than out of graduate programs although somebody could study that. Um, but, um, uh, and as far as management in the developing world, um, look, you, you, 
uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs uh, that, that I meet and the entrepreneurs in the developing world are really no different from entrepreneurs in any other world. I mean, in Kenya, Kenya had uh, unbelievable banking services through the iPhone long before anybody dreamed about it. Um, so, so the entrepreneurs are fine and just as interesting. It's the trouble becomes when these senior managers start to ape uh, what's going wrong in America with all the MBA programs and, and, and all this disconnected leadership and, and all that stuff. You know, you inherit a wealthy company and boy, you're all set, you know, you, you're made because, you, you know, and of course any profit that comes, which is probably because of your predecessor, uh, is your own, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, So I think they have to be careful about the model uh, that's become so prevalent in the developed world. So there's a question here. I also see I'm going back several minutes now, but this idea of wealth concentration and the effect it has on the quality of management. How do we deal with that? Well, that's, I think that's just the main, not just, but that's this, the the most obvious manifestation of the imbalance, um, and, and 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 that simply can't be tolerated. But if we keep cutting taxes, look at the, all the tax cutting that's taken place. My own country, Canada, which is one of the more balanced places in the world, brought its corporate tax rate down to fifteen percent long before the U.S. Congress uh, the, uh, engaged in the recent reduction from thirty-three to whatever it is. Uh, 21 or whatever. We were at 15. Well, what the heck are we doing? That's ridiculous. And of course, what do we do? We throw the we throw the extra taxes onto sales tax, which is regressive. Uh, we create regressive taxes to make up for the fact that we don't have progressive taxes. It's awful. And and you know, it's a way to start. And you know, the U.S. economy was booming. Did very well in the 60s. You know, the the 50s, the 60s after World War. II, Lyndon Johnson with his, uh, what is it called? The Just, no, that was Canada Just Society. I forget what he called it, but you know, the welfare programs that Johnson introduced. Um, and yet the economy was doing extremely well. Well, now we, we hear that the economy is doing extremely well. Yeah, sure. For who? And, and, and we hear that there's three point whatever percent unemployment. Yeah. Uh, work. driven to poverty by employment, um, by awful employment. Um, you know, earlier, Erica, you asked me about other sort of things that bug me. I, they're coming out one by one, you know, including what we've been doing. You know, um, downsizing, which is just a form of bloodletting. It's no different than bloodletting in medicine. 200 years ago or 100 years ago, whatever it was. Downsizing is you don't make your numbers, so you fire thousands of workers. You know, why did, you, why did they suddenly become redundant? Like, how do you, what better way to destroy a company? If your back's against the wall and you're going bankrupt, sure. But if you're healthy, if you didn't make your numbers, so you fire 5,000 people, what kind of craziness? Well, I said before, what is dumbing down so many people? What kind of craziness is this? Not only that people do it, but that it becomes fashionable. It should be laughed at. Yeah. Um, Michael or David, one more question in the minute we have remaining for Henry. I think one question that was sort of lingering was uh, future orientation and the SDGs, the agenda that maybe the world is trying to embrace and balancing uh, global society. What you think is sort of maybe a requisite uh, step towards that uh, possibility for managers and, and education. Uh, Wait, say the first part again. I, I'm not sure I followed. The SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals developed by the United Nations uh, as an agreement of 193 countries. Uh, to, I think you can interpret it as, as a plan to rebalance society. Yeah, well, I, you know, you know what I think of plans. Uh, have a look at my book called The Rise and Fall of Strategic Planning. Um, it's very easy to come up with numbers. Well, maybe it wasn't that easy, but, but it's easy to come up with goals. It's the execution that matters. And you don't need the goals to execute. You need the intent and the concern 
and the energy to execute. And um, and 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 there are, there are ways to 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 promote and generate balance. Uh, the goals are fine, um, but um, you know what. Uh, you know, uh, the Paris Accord uh, uh, for climate change, you know, uh, are the companies meeting their targets? Uh, who's meeting their targets? I guess some are, some aren't. And it's, 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 it's not just a question of generating goals. It's a question of, um, of um, uh, really having the intent to change things. And that means a whole shift in mindset. You know, it's a, it's a whole shift in how we view the world and, and, and how we treat the world and so on. I, I wanted to say something earlier, Eric, and I think I have a chance to say it now based on that, because you said, how do, how do we throw off the shackles? You know, uh, you know, the old American expression about, well, it's in the national anthem about the home, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, if we want to be free, we had better become brave. Um, uh, otherwise we'll lose it. So it's not just goals, it's actions. Henry, thank you so much. Uh, we're at our hour of necessary conversation. Um, I know there are several people who must get off the call now. I know several are interested potentially in staying on. If you'd like to take another question or two, we can continue for five yes. or so more minutes. I have to be somewhere. I have to leave in about five, 10 minutes here. Okay, so let's, um, let's see if there's an, one more question or two. For those of you hanging on, um, have we missed anything that we, we really can't get off the call with Henry without posing? There, there's, there's one interesting question. Uh, it, it's, it's a big one. It probably takes more time, but maybe we can get started. Why is the world so much focused on fixing the problems and not so much focused on realizing potential of the individual? Because the problem is that we're not realizing the potential of the individual. Very quick answer. <laughs> yeah. It's the individual, we're not realizing their potential. If you don't have a job, if you graduate from university and you don't have a job, what's the use of having potential? You know, that's why we're trying to fix the problem so those kids can get jobs and decent jobs and not have to work, you know, at McDonald's at $9 an hour, which is obscene, uh, whatever it is, $11, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. In, in, in Copenhagen, they make 25 bucks an hour. That makes money. Oh, there's actually, I like this question a lot. Henry, what questions do you wish we had asked you? Or what questions should we have asked you that we didn't? Oh, yes, okay. Uh, it just occurs to me. So, I'm working on this piece called Donald Trump is not the problem. Wait, I don't, I don't know where this is. Can you see that? It's all scribbled <laughs> up. And, uh, and I need to publish it, and it's 15 it's a bit more pages long. Um, and so if anybody has a good friend who's the editor of The Atlantic or uh, The New Yorker or, or any of these things, please put me straight in touch, henry.minsberg at mcgill.ca. That would, so what's the question? Oh, how do I publish my article? That's <laughs> Well, that, that was a good question. Okay, how do you publish your article? And and who knows someone who can help Henry? There you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's very, you know, it's so hard to get through. I mean, I, you know, my blog is great and I love the people follow it and there's 15,000, which is terrific. Um, but to convey what we've been doing in management development, to convey this whole message about rebalancing society. And, and the key message is about balance requires a third a recognition of a third sector, not third rate, um, but but plural alongside public and private. And you know, I have a book called Rebalancing Society that lays it all out, um, but you haven't seen that on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, you could find that on New York Times worst seller list, maybe. Great. Henry, thank you so much. I, again, as I mentioned, we um, clearly had a, a our highest ever number of registrants. So this topic and this conversation with you has garnered incredible interest. Um, this was a, an hour well worth all of our lunch period. So thank you very, thank very you much. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you, thank you all. It was worth, obviously worth doing, part of the answer to the question. Thank you.
So yeah, we'll close the video. Uh, everyone is welcome to the recording. And again, Henry, many thanks. Okay, bye all. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Bye everybody.